Some infinities are bigger than other infinities. In John Green's novel, now also a movie, The Fault in Our Stars, the protagonist Hazel is coming to terms with mortality and impermanence as she lives with a very serious form of cancer. Near the end of the story, Hazel says something incredibly profound which helps her explain the value of her life, even if it is shortened by cancer. She says, There are infinite numbers between zero and one. There's point one. There's point one two and point one one two and an infinite collection of others. Of course, there's an even bigger infinite set of numbers between zero and two, or between zero and a million. Some infinities are bigger than other infinities. Some infinities are bigger than other infinities. Her life may be shorter than some other people's, but it's no less infinite, no less meaningful. It's a beautiful mathematical metaphor. There's just one problem. Hazel's math is wrong. The third chapter of the Gospel of John contains perhaps the most famous verse in all of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that those that believe in him might not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16 is regarded as a microcosm, a gospel within the gospel, and therefore it's become popular to use it as an evangelistic tool. Christians scrawl John 3.16 on billboards, on their clothing, on their cars, and football players write it on their eye black. And the form of Christianity most associated with this kind of evangelism likes to add a heaping dose of hellfire to accompany the promise of eternal life. It's a portrayal of the gospel I find deeply unconvincing, based on a cosmology I know to be incorrect. There's no hell under the earth, and there's no heaven above the sky. Beyond our sky is a vast universe with no edge, containing galaxies beyond counting. No edge. If John 3.16 is a microcosm of the gospel, then it does not mean believe in Jesus or else you'll burn in hell. I'm not alone in being unconvinced. Many of the people I meet wonder why I bother with this whole Christianity thing. Those stories you tell are just so full of holes. Why keep repeating them? And I reply, You have no idea. There are holes within holes. For example, two verses before the famous verse it says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the human one be lifted up. The human one here is a title for Jesus, and being lifted up is one of John's metaphorical ways of referring to being crucified. So this is saying that Jesus must be crucified. But what's all this about Moses and a snake? It's a reference to a crazy interlude in the Book of Numbers, when the people of Israel are wandering in the desert, and they're complaining about the food being bad. So God sends a bunch of snakes to bite them, and tons of people are dying. Snakes! 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 snakes. So the people apologize to Moses for complaining, and Moses says, Hey God, they're sorry! Can you cut it out with the snakes now? Snakes! Snakes! Ah! Ah! Snakes! snakes. Ah! And God says, Nah, I'm gonna keep the snakes. Snakes are cool. Snakes. No! They snakes. get stuck! More snakes! snakes. Ah! But then God says, Well, you can make a bronze serpent, and you can put it up on a pole, and hold it up, and then if anyone gets bit by a snake, they can look at the serpent, and the poison won't kill them. They'll live. So when I read this story about Moses and the snake, it just seems to confirm some of the worst perceptions of Christian theology. That God creates these artificial problems just so that God can provide arbitrary solutions, which don't really seem that helpful at the end of the day. But there are holes within holes. I haven't finished finding fault with this story yet. The other time that the bronze serpent is mentioned in the Old Testament is in 2 Kings, where it's given a name. It's called the Nehushtan. Nehushtan, Nehushtan, Nehushtan. Many centuries after Moses, a king named Hezekiah had a problem with the people of Israel and Judea worshipping at shrines besides the temple in Jerusalem. One of these shrines is where that bronze serpent, the Nehushtan, was preserved. People were burning incense to it and praying like it was an idol, so Hezekiah had it crushed. The Nehushtan basically ended up becoming another golden calf, another replacement god. So when we connect that back to the part where John is saying that Jesus is going to be lifted up like the Nehushtan, does John realize that he's comparing Jesus on the cross to an idol? What are we supposed to do with stories that contain so many flaws? When John Green wrote Hazel's insight about infinite sets and the fault in our stars, he knew that Hazel's math was wrong. The infinite set contained between 0 and 1 is actually the exact same size as the set between 0 and 2. So. Hazel is technically incorrect about that, but she's right that some infinities are bigger than others, just not the specific infinite sets that she compared. John Green wanted to show that even though a 16-year-old Hazel was drawing incorrect abstract conclusions about complex mathematics, those conclusions could still provide real and lasting consolation. The process of making meaning is active and personal.
Meaning is not an inherent quality of the material we're drawing from, whether that material is mathematics, or the universe, or the Bible, or young adult fiction. The conclusions that we draw will often be a mixture of correct and incorrect inferences from complex lives, but those conclusions may still provide real and lasting consolation. It is not correct that accepting certain propositional truths about Jesus will grant you never-ending life. But John is right about God loving this world. And John is right that Jesus exemplifies that love. And John is even right that trusting Jesus leads to an eternal life, so long as you remember that some eternities are longer than other eternities. Be grateful. You have been given forever within the numbered days. Thank you for watching. I hope you'll like and subscribe and comment and share this around. In case it wasn't clear by now, I'm following the Revised Common Lectionary, and you can find links to further study the scripture passage down in the thing below. I want to say thank you to John Green for writing such an excellent novel, and to Vi Hart for helping him clarify and express such a beautiful idea. Don't forget to be awesome. Ah! No! I am making stuff! More snakes! Ah! Snakes! 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 Snakes!